I am very happy to be here um, across the continent or halfway across um, with Jeremy Dank, who's at home in upstate New York. Yes, eating some cashew nuts, which is my regular snack up here. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's, that's a very good idea. Mm -hmm. So, so many of us enjoyed so much your um, Green Space event on the Bach, the first book of the Well-Tempered Clavier, which we had been looking forward to having you perform for us um, in just a few days, April 27th and 28th. Mm -hmm. And instead, we will be joining you once again at the Green Space. Mm -hmm. So, um, I love the way you talked about Bach um, and the contentment and happiness that you felt working on this. And how has it been, I mean, now to be working on Bach somewhat, I guess, still, and you had these concerts canceled. I mean, what was all of that like? Because you must have been working on this a very long time. Yeah, I, I had a couple of weeks where I couldn't practice the Bach anymore. Um, you know, it was a sense that 16 months of my life had sort of vanished in two days of cancellations. And then that, you know, it pales next to many other people's problems right now, but it still, it felt like a bereavement and, and I couldn't be at the piano really for a couple of weeks, I was up here. And I did a lot of writing and walking. Um, and then I started gingerly coming back into Bach and, and what do you know, he's still, he's still good. <laughs> I still found uh, pleasures, but it was different pleasure in it. Yeah. yeah, I find there's, there's, especially in this moment, that Bach has such a kind of stabilizing quality. Um, you can come to the piano in so many different moods and maybe not even the mood to be at the piano, but somehow starting with Bach brings one, for me at least, it brings one into a kind of world of sanity, which is extremely reassuring in times like this. Yeah, we could all use some sanity at the moment. Um, that's, that's very true. And I think that's one thing that I find in Bach to the order and, and the sense of the inevitability. I think when I was talking about a little bit in the green space thing was um, Bach's sense of flow in time and the way that he makes you experience a certain segment of time or an arc or a simple harmonic progression um, with a kind of patience. That's true of the C sharp major that I talked about there. And, and also the C, the first C major prelude, he makes you hear every harmony twice. And I think that's an important aspect of that prelude. People don't talk about this. It's kind of patience of hearing, no matter how intense the harmony is or how dissonant or ready to resolve it is, he makes you listen to it twice. Yeah. So there's something about those pieces that they have that like a kind of a river or a stream flow of time. And it's, and I have a little stream in the back of my property too that I go to in the mornings with my coffee often and, and I watch the water flow by. And, and then I come back to the Bach and Bach has this similar way that he, you know, the streams have a, a simple flow it seems like, but then they also have all these little tiny bends and changes and a rock in the stream. and and so in the one sense, there's a very simple line and in another, there's a very complex and infinitely unknowable number of curves and eddies. And, and Bach does that too. He has these simple opening premises and then he begins to wind them through harmonies or rhythm in ways that, that are hard to predict. And I think he's after that, that same feeling. I think that's part of what makes Bach feel so true to life and so, um, as you say, calming or stabilizing. Um. Yeah, I love the the connection to nature is very nice. I think we often think of Bach as religious and and see that spirituality in his music, but the the simple connection with with nature, which anyone in that time would have been closer to in a lot of ways, you know, wouldn't have had to travel maybe so far to get um, yeah, that's true. connection. Um, that. Yes, there, there's that connection between what Bach does and somehow the, the greater world. And I think also, um, you know, I used the word when we were talking about Bach, you know, just before we started this, um, that when you can come to him in a different mood because there's some kind of, you can enter in this kind of neutral space, his personality allows you when you're not dealing with a personality like 
Beethoven first thing in the morning. You know, there's a different relationship to the personality of Bach, don't you think? Yeah, he's not, um, this is a loaded word, he's not manipulating time in the, or emotion in the same way. Um, there are sometimes surprises in Bach, but it's not like say early Beethoven or Haydn or even, even Mozart, this sort of constant oscillation between different characters and the use of, of contrast constantly. Um, yeah, he, he's after um, <laughs> a subtler kind of unfolding than, than that. He's also- Yeah, yeah. that's also had something to do with how he saw himself as well, no? I mean, it's just a, a different, different worldview, different view of self as artist than someone like Beethoven or Chopin. I wish I knew how Bach saw himself. I'm, I, I feel like among other things, the Bach biography is much leaner on facts and, and anecdotes uh, than, than either Bach or be, either Beethoven or Chopin. Oh, yeah, I, I feel Bach as an individual still remains such a, a mystery. There so are these the enormous biographies of Bach and many of them are like Bach may have felt or it's possible, you know, and, and there's so much speculation. It's like a Shakespeare biography in that sense. You know, it's like you're building a castle on, on I don't know, a hundred letters. Yeah, well, and there's something about the greatness of the output, you know, like with Shakespeare, that it's hard to reconcile with an individual in, in the usual ways, or in maybe just in our modern sense of what that means. Um, in terms of tackling, you know, doing the whole book one, mm -hmm. how did that come about? Had you been performing Prelude and Fumes before? recently or no i hadn't at all which made it a particularly uh complicated thing to do um i had learned many of them of course or at least some of them when i was a child um but many of them i was discovering for the first time the ones that students don't like to play at auditions because they're too hard or too weird or whatever and and uh and then I had to just sit there like I was 12 years old again, putting in fingerings and learning entrances and, and kind of color. Well, there's something about, I mean, we all learn those, those preludes and fuse. And when you were talking about um, the other day on, on the Green Space show, you went through the, the, the D major. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, these become real Proustian moments for pianists who, you know, you study them as a child. I mean, that's the prelude and fugue I played for my, you know, Juilliard mm -hmm when I was 11 and I remember mm -hmm. the right hand of that D major, it seemed endless. It was like getting through an enormous Chopin etude in terms of, you know, so coming, and then I also remember, you know, who played which one in the master class. And okay. but then people don't perform them in recital programs too often anymore. Yeah. Well, I have to say that, that you know, as I was playing them and learning them, some of them and relearning some of them, uh, it struck me what a shame it is that we don't spend more time with them because not only does it, um, not only is it beautiful music and, uh, and astoundingly fresh, you know, like it keeps pouring out. Um, and, and, it, and it, it's not at all, um, it's a teaching piece that has very little pedantry, actual pedantry in it, you know, even in the, kind of exercise pieces like the C minor prelude, which is about a certain kind of hand position. And in the D major, which you mentioned, which is another kind of really difficult etude like right hand. Um, you also have this, as I was talking about the kind of mad scientists, you know, there's always this other element that is making the, um, making the exercise uh, wild and, and unexpected, you know? Um, so there's that and, and, and it just feels good to play them. <laughs> um, and, and, you, the fugues maybe even more than the preludes, but I don't know. It, it comes different day by day. Yeah. Well, they contain so much of what one then uses in playing so much other music. You know, I mean, the control of voices in the fugue, the digital exercise of a lot of the preludes, mm -hmm. you know, it has so much of the essence of then what we do in other places. Yeah, and then how to control and infinitely complex uh, long singing line like in the c sharp minor prelude you know that's a very difficult sentence to unwind you know it's it's more 
sinuous than a, any Chopin nocturne, really. And it has a lot of the same sense of winding in and out of beautiful colors and trying to find your way back and kind of an aerodynamic complication, which is you, you want to keep it going, but you don't want it to fall entirely. And, and you want to keep unwinding the story. And that sort of thing, you're absolutely right. It's an incredibly useful skill and one in a way that we almost never finish learning in our, in our lives. Um, yeah, maybe another reason we, you know, we keep going back to Bach. And I was so glad when you were doing your greatest hits, I mean, that C-sharp minor is such an incredible, incredible piece, um, both the prelude and, I mean, the fugue is yeah. just, you know, like a cathedral. Um, yeah. But I don't, I don't, you know, it's not one that students play all that often. And the fugue that you talked about, you know, it's that dissonant opening, it's almost medieval. You yeah. know, it almost, it, it feels like earlier music. He was definitely after that. He was definitely conjuring earlier music, yeah. And it has that strangeness of, um, you know, Gesualdo or something. I mean, it's a fantastic piece. Um, I, was, I was so glad that you included that. The other really strange one, of course, is, is the last one, the B minor. Yeah, the B minor. The B minor I wanted to put on that program, but it seemed like a lot with the C sharp minor. And yeah, I would see you need to choose yeah. between those. And I thought also, yeah, it was enough darkness for now too. We needed a little more joy, but the B minor, the B minor has less of a perceptible through line, you know? It seems more of a kind of a forest in, of chromaticism and uncertainty that- Well, it has this, it has a long theme, but it's practically all 12 tones in that theme. You know, it's a, it's, it's yeah. a strange one. So tell us a little bit, can we get a little highlight of what's coming up next in, in part two? Well, we're hoping when I collate all this stuff, I, I, I wanted people to give their vision of Bach. We were talking about how Bach, you know, is, is difficult to pin down biographically. And I wanted to sort of have people respond to certain moments of Bach's biography. And, and there are a lot of little weird anecdotes and they can be interpreted a lot of different ways. And they, they are. Um, and it, it, you know, it made me think of sort of people picking at crumbs and you're trying to assemble this story. And there's so little, and, and, I, and, and like little fragments of meaning that are his life. You know? And I wanted to have a program. So I hope the second program will be like that, talking a little bit into Bach from a, a lot of different angles. And then there'll be some musical interludes. It sounds great. And I know that, you know, a lot of your Decamera crowd will, will be there with you, um, if not physically, you know, um, from afar. And we are working on getting you back to Houston so that we can hear the whole thing. Right. When you perform, I am curious, performing the entire book, because, you know, unlike something like the Goldberg Variations, I mean, it's not, it's not a performative work in the sense that Bach created it to be performed from the C major prelude to the B minor, mm -hmm. but you must, and that C sharp minor huge fugue comes so early in a way, but have you found as you pace yourself through it, is there an inner structure that unfolds for you in how they lead one to the next? You know, it's, it's, it's less of a, kind of a scheme than the Goldberg versions, but I don't think that it's that much less of a story. Um, there are highlights, uh, there are places of relief. It does visit certain themes obsessively. Obviously one of them is the division of the world into minor and major, major and minor, like, the, like in the Genesis, that there was the sun and there was the moon, it was the night and the day or whatever. Um, and I think as you play that piece, you feel, you know, sort of even from the beginning, the major and then the, the darkness of the minor, and you keep crossing from one side to the other. And that is an incredibly important theme in the piece, mm -hmm. the translation of, of, of ideas and, and the color shifts. Um, and then one thing he's incredibly obsessed with certain harmonies, especially different seventh chords. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I find a lot of the pieces are concerned with teasing out these chords and what they can do, kind of like a, a demonstration, you know, like here is it. Um, and then 
there are all, all, as I said, sort of these pieces that are about escape or freedom that seem to have set up one, one idea and then just to unravel the whole thing, you know, change course mid, mid prelude or whatever. Um, and then clearly, you know, some way through it, I feel a new, a, a kind of a new perspective hits mm -hmm. you. Yeah. And you begin to feel that there are these little recurrences and you begin to hear the piece as a, almost like um, an endless loop of, of text. And I, I like to play the C major prelude at the end again, after the B minor. I was actually gonna ask you about that. Yeah, after the B minor, then you really feel, you know, you play it just as if you would in the Goldbergs play the theme again. When you play that C major prelude after that, it's pretty redemptive in a way that is, is hard to resist. That, that's, that's amazing. That's an amazing idea. I love that. And then, of course, it's amazing that Bach then decided to go back and do the whole thing all over again. And I think that's so important. You know, like I said, I don't know if that was in the Green Space thing or in some other interview that I talked about. My image of this piece is, is um, Noah's Ark, you know, the, the animals two by two going on to the, you know, it's do this kind of fugue and this one, and, then, and they keep filing on. And, and then, but it's also the kind of pieces like he did all the keys, right? He created this encyclopedia of every key. And then he's like, no, but the world can't be limited by that. You know, those keys, there's another whole way of doing it. And in a way, this piece almost begs to be rewritten. Um, seeing all the notes again through a different path. And I, I think that's also really moving. How, how many years later was it that he does book two? Oh, don't quiz me on that. That's I, I mean, I'm just, I never thought about it myself. I don't know. I think it's but, 10, 10, 15 years. It's a good while later, right? And there's a lot of speculation that he, he was in prison at least part of the time, right? Writing the first set. And I don't remember why he took up the second set. Hmm. Yeah. But it is, I mean, the thing about Bach is this sense of unlimited invention that every time he does something, he could have done something else instead, you know, that there's so much choice. And you don't feel that with every composer, but with Bach, you just know he had a million different ideas going on. Well, there's a beautiful book for the sort of wonkily oriented called uh, Bach and the Patterns of Invention uh, by Lawrence Dreyfus. And he talks about you know, how can we you know our minds reconstruct how Bach worked to create these pieces? And he, he, he has this wonderful anecdote that, that, that you know, the Bach would hear an, a melody and he would know instantly all the operations that could be done with it. Could you play it backwards with itself? Could you play it upside down with itself? You know, what, what could you do? And then he had a vision of dispersing the possibilities of the idea around the piece in various keys and then connecting them. And, hmm. and then he always saves one of the most interesting or unusual possibilities for about two thirds or three quarters of the way through, you know, for the sort of golden section. And then it becomes a, as you like a, a narrative of possibilities, like a, like a crystal that you turn in various mm -hmm. ways. Amazing. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Um, and we'll see you again very soon. Enjoy your time in the country as best you can and stay safe. Yes, best wishes to everyone. Stay safe. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jeremy.